Hello, and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and in this video, uh, this video is called A Doll's House Plot Act 2, Backwards and Forwards, uh, and Part 1. It's a rather long title. In this video, um, as it says, I'm going to be talking about the plot of Act 2, but doing a, a sort of different way of approaching it, which is to approach it from the end and work backwards. So the method that I want to illustrate here in practice is uh, this backwards and forwards reading where we trace the action backwards through the narrative. We start with uh, the end of the act and look back to identify what the key moments of decision, crisis, change, uh, the moments that led to the end. How did we get to where we are at the end of this act? And by going through this, this backwards reading process, uh, it allows us to discover some really interesting patterns and repetitions that might not be obvious reading it through the normal way from beginning to end. Uh, and it also helps us to really understand the logic of the plot and the character development. We really see why things happen. And so in doing so, I think it's a, a great way to understand texts once you've once you've read a play or, or any story to go back through it backwards um, as a way to really understand how the narrative works, how the characters decisions build on each other and how earlier events anticipate later ones and how later events um, look back on and uh, cause us to, to rethink, uh, look differently at things that happened earlier. So beginning from the end, with Nora as our protagonist, we ask ourselves, what is her situation at the close of Act 2? Where is she? What's happening to her? What's going on in her mind in terms of her, uh, the crisis, the story of the play? And how did she get there? What events led up to her being in this state, in this situation, in this particular dilemma that she's going to be in? So if we notice at the very end of the act, um, there's this crisis that she seems to be going through, or this split, internal split. To Torvald, she says very cheerily, here is your song, Lark. But just a moment before that, to herself, we, we see her counting down um, the hours until after the holiday when Torvald is going to find out, uh, open Krogstad's letter and find out what has happened. And she says 31 hours left to live. So it's this very stark contrast between how she talks to herself uh, and what's going on um, with her, what, what she's feeling, and how she's presenting herself to Torvald. On the one hand, she's singing um, and she's expressing joy, but on the other hand, there is this sense of impending doom, impending death. She only has a short time left to live on this earth. Uh, and she doesn't want to reveal that, obviously. She doesn't want to reveal that to Torvald. There's also the opposition between presence and absence. She's here now. Here is your song, Lark. But in 31 hours, she'll be gone. And gone forever is, is at least how she's planning. She's, if she's going to die, if she's going to kill herself, or if something's going to happen that's going to destroy her way of life, it's going to be absent. It's going to be erased. So presence versus absence. And of course, that her outer appearance, which the way she's behaving, the way she's talking, the way she uh, presents herself to Torvald and others, and the inner despair that she's feeling, this inner rot. Uh, and uh, these are all issues that, that relate to, or these are all oppositions that relate to many other issues and uh, moments throughout the play, um, some of which we'll talk about in this video and uh, part two of this video. So let's ask ourselves, what is it that precipitates this split within Nora? What is it that causes her to, on the one hand, be telling her husband uh, and pretending to her husband that things are all right while planning her own death or planning for her own death? So she says that she is waiting for the miraculous. We know that Krogstad has sent a letter to Torvald Hemmer, Helmer which Torvald hasn't yet opened. And in it, he's blackmailing Torvald to keep his job. Um, as we will talk about in a, in a few minutes, he is threatening to reveal Nora's forgery, Nora's crime, unless Torvald keeps him on at the bank. Uh, and in response to this letter, Nora says that she's waiting for the miraculous. She's waiting for something miraculous to occur. And that's an uh, uh, an a theme or a motif that's been um, repeated throughout the play 
uh, thus far, and we'll see it a couple more times in this scene. So there's a she's waiting for something, and that is what has precipitated uh, this crisis, the split within her. And she's waiting for something miraculous to happen in response to Krogstad finally, um, basically revealing uh, or sending the letter that will reveal to Torvald what she's done and her her crime. And she has said to Torvald what she's done is she's uh, preventing him from opening the letter, right? That's why she has 31 hours. Uh, it's not until he opens the letter that this uh, either miraculous thing will happen or she'll die or whatever it is that she's, she seems to be fearing. And so she tells him, you're not to think either today or tomorrow about anything but me. You're not to open any letters, not open the letterbox. Nothing ugly must come between us before it's all over. Torvald, of course, doesn't quite pick up on this, uh, the portentousness of this, of her phrasing of her words before it's all over. He uh, presumably assumes that she means just the holidays, before the holidays are over. Uh, but she, of course, is talking about the truth of what has happened, that Krogstad's letter is the ugly thing that's going to come between them before her life is over, before their marriage is over, before this uh, idyllic existence that they've been living is destroyed, is shattered or before the miraculous event, whatever that is, the miraculous event that she's waiting for. So the crisis, in other words, is precipitated by the letter and her suspension before the opening of that letter. She's prevented Torvald from opening it and uh, sealing her fate, so to speak, uh, or revealing her fate. And so it's in this suspension that she is paused, that she is uh, a split between death and joy. Let's talk about the letter for a moment, and I just want to play on that word, letter. A letter is, of course, something that you write on a piece of paper and send to someone, but letter is also a letter of the alphabet, the uh, most elementary uh, components of words, of our language. So you write letters on a letter, um, and the letter is the verdict. That is, it speaks the truth. Verdict literally means true speech or speaking the truth, speaking truly. Um, and so the verdict is revealing, the letter is going to reveal what she's done, reveal her crime. Um, it is the judge that's going to show that she has committed a crime in some sense. And the letter is also a sentence, obviously a play there, sentence as in a series of words, sentence as in what uh, uh, you are, what the consequences are if you are uh, condemned, if you are found guilty of something. And she has an unknown future. She doesn't know what is going to happen when Torvald opens this letter. And as long as it's closed, as long as the letter remains undelivered, she is in this moment of suspension, torn between fear and joy, torn, torn between life and death, um, because she doesn't know what Torvald's going to do, what judgment is he going to pass on her, what sentence is he going to pass on her when he opens the letter and sees, learns the truth. So this is her dilemma at this moment, um, near the end of the, the play, she's, or at the end of the scene. She doesn't know how he's going to react, and so she's trying to prevent him from reading the letter, right? So again, moving backwards, how is it that she prevents him from re really uh, reading the letter? How is it that she prevents him and thus then puts herself in this moment of suspension, this pause between uh, the uh, before Torvald finds out and everything is revealed? Well, the key element is the dance, this dance that she's practicing, the tarantella that she's practicing for their party that they're going to go to, a holiday party at their neighbors. And Nora says, oh, sit down and play for me, dear Torvald. Correct me. Instruct me as you always do. And as she dances, she begins to dance as the uh, stage directions tell us um, rather wildly going faster and faster, and Torvald says, not so fiercely, Nora. My dear sweet Nora, you're dancing as if your life depended on it. And once he realizes that she is out of control in her dancing, she doesn't know what she's doing, or perhaps she knows exactly what she's doing. She's uh, pretending to be, or she's letting herself get wild in this dance in order to um, draw Torvald's attention. And once he sees that she can't do the dance as he expects her to, she says, you must instruct me right to the very last moment. 
the last moment, of course, before the dance and the last moment, the last moment of the play, the last moment of their life that they're leading as husband and wife. So the dance is her key to preventing Torvald from reading the letter. It's what uh, uh, holds off the moment of truth for her. So in this, this ploy, this dance that she uses as a ploy to distract Torvald from the letter, how is she presenting herself to Torvald? What, um, uh, uh, how is she behaving? What personality or what side of herself is she, sh is she showing? What feelings or thoughts do you think she's trying to arouse in him? What is she trying to get him to feel? Why is she, uh, and, and what does she want from him? Right. She says, of course, she wants him to teach her how to dance, but what more does she want from them? How does this, how, how is this part of, uh, uh, how is this going to help her or what is she trying to perhaps set up with Torvald for when he does eventually open the letter and find out the truth? Just some questions to consider. Let's continue to move backwards through Act Two. Right before uh, Dr. Rank and uh, Helmer come out and the scene with the dance happens, she's talking to Mrs. Linda and she tells Mrs. Linda everything that's going on with Krogstad and says, uh, at the end, she, she says that again, she's waiting for the miraculous. After all, it's the most miraculous thing that's about to happen now, but it's so terrible, Christine, it mustn't happen, not for anything in the world. So this is, seems like an odd thing to say, of course, if she's waiting for the miraculous, um, but she's also saying that it's something that shouldn't happen. And even more odd that it's both miraculous and terrible. So how is it that a miracle, whatever miracle, whatever wondrous thing that's going to happen, how can it be both miraculous and terrible? How can it unite these two uh, seemingly opposite ideas? And so what is it exactly that she's afraid will happen? What And why doesn't she want it to happen? It's miraculous, so in a sense, it's something perhaps that she thinks is good, but she also doesn't want it to happen for some reason. And what is it that precipitates, again, this immediate expression of fear? What is it that causes her to say something miraculous is going to happen, but she doesn't want it to happen? So what she's said to Christine after telling her about uh, everything with Krogstad, she says, now there's just one thing I want to tell you, Christine. You've got to be my witness. If there were someone who wanted to take everything upon themselves, all the blame, then you'll be a witness to it not being true. Christine, I'm telling you, nobody else knew about this. I did the whole thing on my own. And this is what she says just a moment before saying something miraculous is going to happen. And, but it mustn't happen because it's also terrible. Christine, Linda is of course very confused by this. Why are you telling me this? Why are you saying that you might go mad? Why are you insisting upon this? What is it that you think is going to happen? Let's ask ourselves about Nora's fear here. She's afraid that she's going to go insane. She's going to afraid that someone is going to take the blame upon themselves. She's afraid of something miraculous. So let's ask ourselves, why does she need a witness? And a witness is of course, something that people normally have in a court of law, right? You bring witnesses. Um, of course, if you want to have a witness on your side, it's usually someone who's going to uh, attest to your innocence, right? Or the guilt of the other party. But why does she need a witness to her guilt? Why does she insist upon her guilt? What does she think may happen? Why is she trying to ensure that her guilt is known? So let's go back to the issue of oppositions. We talked about some of them earlier. Nora's internal struggle, of course, right? This internal struggle between her fear of something terrible happening and her hope for something miraculous, her despair, which is the exact same thing, of course, her despair um, and, 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 uh, uh, inner uh, sense of pain and her outer appearance of joy, 
the question of Torvald's reaction, what is he going to do? How is he going to react when he learns what has happened? And again, that idea of the miraculous and the terrible somehow united in one. The issue of oppositions, I think, is very important in this play. It's a, it's a, a motif or it's a structural element that, that appears over and over again, things that are at odds with each other or in tension, but also have a sort of link to each other, certain things in common. The, the miraculous and terrible thing is the most obvious because it's the exact same thing that is both miraculous and terrible. But Nora's internal struggle within her, within the individual, which literally means indivisible, cannot be divided. She is divided. So that's something to think about um, as uh, it's one of those patterns, the pattern of oppositions. Why is that something that recurs throughout this, this play? How is Ibsen using the idea of oppositions that sometimes seem to meld or absorb one into the other? What is he doing with that element? And how does it structure the play? How does it help us understand the characters and what they're going through? What is it that led to Nora telling this to Christine, this uh, uh, frantic, anxious confession that she has to get out because of what, uh, what the miraculous thing is about to happen? Well, what is it that had precipitated this? Krogstad, of course. Krogstad had delivered the letter. And when he's delivering the letter, he tells Nora why. He tells Nora what his intention is and what he wants. I want to get back on my feet, Mrs. Helmer. I want to rise in the world, and your husband will help me. And remember, it's your husband himself who's forced me back onto such a path. Let's pause for a moment to think about different forms of value that we see in this play. And I think the two main forms of value that we see are money and reputation. Money is material. Money is wealth. Money is physical, usually. Uh, although money, of course, can also be credit which is when you are good for it. You may not have the money, but you're good for it. And then there's reputation, which is immaterial, which is what people say about you or what people think about you. But of course, reputation is also credit in a sense, right? It's how if people uh, think you are worth it, think you're a worthy person, worthy of a loan, worthy of friendship. So reputation is immaterial, money is material, yet of course they're connected to each other. Reputation might be based on the amount of money you have. Certainly if you have a lot of money, that can help to repair a bad reputation. And we see that Krogstad um, is keen on both. He needs to improve his reputation in order to get more money. He also needs to get money to improve his reputation. That's why he wants to keep his job. So the two are intimately connected. Nora is also keen on money. She feels that more money, her husband's raise will free them, will make give them a new life, a new lifestyle. Torvald, of course, is uh, someone who cares about money. He works at a bank and he's very concerned with expenses and Nora's spending, but he's also very keen on his reputation and the idea that being in debt is bad for one's reputation. So we also can think about what other ways that these, these two are related, money and reputation. And it's again, it's another one of those pairs, those things that are, those oppositions that are also in a sense linked together. Uh, and again, going back to the question that Nora is facing is which will Torvald choose? And how will he choose between them? Back to the scene with Krogstad. After Krogstad, informs Nora that he is going to blackmail her husband to keep him on at the bank. He calls her suicide bluff. She is has been thinking about and suggesting just uh, very obliquely that she's going to go drown herself in the icy waters. And Krogstad says, people don't do such things, Mrs. Helmer. Besides, what purpose would it serve? I'd have him in my pocket all the same. Are you forgetting that I would then have control over the reputation you leave behind? So Nora, even if Nora kills herself, Krogstad still has power over her because he has power over her reputation. Not only does she owe him money, he also now has control of how people think of her. So we might ask ourselves, uh, what choices are left to Nora now? And what ultimately does she fear most from Krogstad? Does she fear that he will uh, continue to hold 
the debt over her head? Does she fear that he's going to hurt Torvald? Does she fear the revelation of her truth to Torvald? Does she fear what will happen if she dies, if she kills herself? But to go back to where we started at the beginning of this uh, video, at the very end of the act, Nora is torn between life and death. She does, and she doesn't know what's going to happen. She's either going to be saved or not. This seems to be the moment where that dilemma really asserts herself. It asserts itself. Torvald is told, or excuse me, Krogstad has told her, "I'm going to tell your husband." The letter is there. The letter's delivered. It just is waiting to be opened. So the truth is there, it just hasn't been exposed yet. It's already, but it's, but it's available. It's present, hidden in the home, in the letterbox. So it's this moment when Krogstad basically tells her, you have no choice. This, I think, is where her crisis at the end uh, uh, really emerges. In a previous video, I talked about some of the connections and parallels between the characters. And here we see uh, another parallel between Nora and Krogstad. Nora asking Krogstad to let them out of the, uh, uh, or not deliver the letter, says, think of my young children. Krogstad responds, have you and your husband thought of mine? Very pointed remark, right? And, and a good point. She is only thinking about herself and her family and he says, Others people have problems too. I have children. I have my own responsibilities. And I'm doing this because of my children, because I want to make good for them and be a good father. And this uh, uh, calls back, of course, the fear that Nora has that as a bad mother or as a, as a criminal mother, someone who committed forgery, she will have a bad effect on her children. And she, uh, when Krogstad says, uh, that she's not going to kill herself. She says, how can you know I'm thinking of that? She never says the word suicide or even says that she's going to jump in the water. He's the one who, who uh, makes it explicit. And he says, most of us think of that in the beginning. I thought of it too, but I honestly didn't have the courage. So both Nora and Krogstad, uh, again, similarity in that they're both, uh, they both committed the same crime of forgery and they both are thinking of the same or have thought of the same way out, suicide. Something else interesting to point out about uh, Krogstad's ultimatum is that he says, it's your husband that has, uh, that has led me to this. It's your husband that's responsible for me going down this path again. I've been good. I haven't done anything criminal for a year and a half, but now I have no choice. So his actions now are a result of Torvald's and Nora's actions. And their response to the letter, Torvald's response to the letter is going to determine what he does in reaction. So he explicitly talks about cause and effect. And if you recall in the first video on plot, I talked about how um, even though the plot of this play is so simple in its structure, it's just a very simple chronological um, A to B to C story. Even in that simplicity, it's doing something, right? This play is in some sense about cause and effect. The plot is about how one action leads to the next. One aspect of the cause and effect process that this play shows us in the character's actions is uh, how individuals have different moral and ethical responsibilities and what the consequences are of following or not following those responsibilities. Nora, Krogstad, Torvald, Dr. Rank, Mrs. Linda, they're all, uh, Anne Marie, they're all dealing with the consequences of their past decisions. And this also, I think, emphasizes the interconnections between individuals, how one individual's actions affect another, how we are all affected and shaped by the things, uh, the lives of those around us. And so many of the characters in this play are seeking a form of freedom, freedom from something, uh, whether it's from debt or from a bad reputation or from past uh, sins. Uh, but that sense of freedom is complicated by the interconnections, by the fact that everyone will be affected by those around them, that one can never be truly free or independent from all other people. And I think also this um, resonates with the idea of debt or with the motif of debt that's been, uh, that's a literal and figurative idea throughout this play. All these characters, Nora in this play especially, is as she has committed uh, a crime in the past, she has taken out a loan, literally, um, but figuratively she has a certain debt, a moral debt to repay. And 
that debt comes due in this play. We can think about the compared to the, the concept of karma. One's past actions come back to haunt or to affect you. One owes a debt to the universe or to others or to the world. One owes a moral or ethical debt, and eventually that debt, that bill has to be paid. Let's do a brief review uh, of this, uh, of what we've talked about so far. So act two ends with Nora in a state of crisis and this split between a uh, uh, expression of joy, public or, or a su superficial expression of joy and happiness and her inner despair and expectation of doom. And she's suspended. She's waiting for judgment. She's waiting to find out what's going to happen to, the, to her. And the letter is what contains this judgment. The letter has tells her truth. And once it is opened by Torvald, that letter will be what determines her fate. She's just waiting for the message to be delivered. And so she's facing this question, what will Torvald do? What will his reaction be to the letter? And that, I think, is intimately related to the notion of the terrible miracle the thing that she hopes yet fears will happen. And so what is that? And how does the terrible miracle relate to her expectations or fears or questions about Torvald's actions? All right, well, that is the end of part one. In part two, I will continue where we left off here, which is with uh, Nora's conversation with Dr. Rank, and then we'll follow that backwards again to the beginning of act two, and then a brief, um, forwards look going from the beginning to the end looking at the patterns and ideas that we've uncovered in this backwards journey through act two uh, if you have any questions there's my email feel free to get in touch with me otherwise i will see you in the next video a doll's house act two backwards and forwards part two and have a great day